Okay, welcome. Hello everyone. Welcome to another chat. Today I'm going to talk about the last video, uh, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, an introduction to Kuhn's philosophy. Um, we're going to apply it to something that's going on today. As usual, um, maybe for one of the last times, that will be the pandemic. Um, but to do that, I'm going to go, and back, go back and discuss the Spanish flu uh, briefly first uh, from a Kuhnian perspective um, and this is based on the first chapter of a great book by the historian Mark Hogginsbaum called The Pandemic Century um, and Hogginsbaum frames pandemics across the course of the 20th century as, uh, the, the, as the people dealing with them as being prisoners of particular paradigms um, that blinds them um, to the truth of what's going on and we'll see that with the Spanish flu and we'll see what we can learn from that today so if you haven't seen that video maybe go and have a look first uh, and come back because this will make much more sense but otherwise let's get stuck straight in so the Spanish flu killed anywhere between 25 and 100 million people during the end of World War One in 1918, 1919, um, it infected uh, up to a billion people. This at a time when World War I only, I say only, but comparatively only, killed 10 million people. Um, and reading histories of the Spanish flu, I think, are really interesting because they are framed in a way in which World War I is a side story, a background story, which says a lot in itself about uh, framing and narratives and, and the artificiality of them. Um, but despite the destructiveness of the Spanish flu, there was a widespread optimism, uh, especially in the West, for two reasons. The first, that flu was thought of as a relatively mild disease, a seasonal mild disease that would come and go quite quickly. Uh, but second, there was a scientific optimism bacteria uh, had recently been discovered in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, in 1892, a scientist, Richard Pfeiffer, um, had discovered what he called Pfeiffer's bacillus. Um, and the germ theory of disease uh, was recently in its ascendancy. Um, and people were discovering that microorganisms could make you sick. So when patients of influenza were studied, the Pfeiffer's bacillus was present largely in phlegm from the nose, throat and ears. Um, and so everyone thought, like other diseases, uh, that a vaccine would be developed based on identifying the very specific bacteria that caused influenza. Um, of course, we know now that influenza is caused by a virus, not a bacteria. Uh, a virus is much, much smaller than a bacteria, couldn't be seen through a microscope, whereas a ba bacteria could. Um, a virus is anywhere between 75 and 100 nanometers in diameter, which is about a hundredth the breadth of a human hair. Um, but we didn't discover this until uh, the electron microscope was invented in the 1940s, I think in 1940. Um, but at the time, everyone thought that this bacteria caused it. And that's because the virus causes the primary infection, the influenza infection, but that weakened immune systems and allowed this bacteria, this secondary infection, to infect uh, the nose, throat and ears too. So it was often found. Um, and people were so confident, in fact, that there's one, uh, there's a wire to the Surgeon General, the US Surgeon General, that says... It's established that the influenza at Cam Devons is caused by the bacillus of Pfeiffer. And the 1919 edition of a textbook of bacteriology states, the relationship between the clinical disease known as influenza or gripe and the Pfeiffer bacillus has been definitely established by numerous investigations. Um, and so the confidence was that we just keep working away and we create a vaccine as soon as possible, like other diseases. 
Um, but anomalies started to build up in the Kuhnian sense. You know, they see it through this particular paradigm, and the anomaly was that this bacteria wasn't always present uh, in the phlegm um, that was being studied. It was mostly present, but not always. So this did concern some people. This did uh, uh, raise a lot of questions. One person who tried to answer those questions was a scientist by the name of Charles Nicole, uh, a French scientist. And he used a device called a Chamberlain filter, which had recently been invented. It was a big filter made of porcelain that you could pass water through and the porcelain pores were smaller than bacteria. So water could be filtered through and clean water could come out uh, and they were used in places like hotels. Charles Nicole passed the fluid of influenza patients through the Chamberlain filter and discovered that it would still infect animals, even though Pfeiffer's bacillus had been filtered out of it. Um, and so this was a huge anomaly, but for the most part, no one listened. Um, Later, one of the doctors working, or one of the scientists working on this, uh, reflected in 1967, well, we were just 100% wrong. And it's a chapter I wish I had never written. So what does this mean for us today? Can this help us in any way today? Um, I think there's a similar optimism at the moment in our ability to uh, find and manufacture on a mass scale a vaccine um, and that this bleeds into two areas i see this a lot in responses to the market um for example or market responses to news even for example um you know the markets have rebounded today on positive news from drug tri trials on a vaccine on the covid19 vaccine um and in politics as well um you usually hear something like we're going to have to continue social distancing to a certain extent until there's a vaccine. Um, we need to keep planning to do X, Y, Z until there's a vaccine. And people presume there will be a vaccine uh, soon. Um, and I think one of the areas we're overly optimistic about is the speed at which we can do that. Um, the quickest a vaccine has ever been developed and manufactured is four years. That's the quickest ever. On average, they take around 11 years uh, to be manufactured, uh, developed and manufactured. Um, and there are huge problems with uh, rushing these programs through quickly. For example, in 1955, a polio vaccine was rushed through quickly um, and ended up killing uh, many children that it was tested on and paralyzing uh, many others. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have optimism in a vaccine. Uh, but just that politically, socially, um, it's a good idea to spread your eggs out in a few different baskets to, pre to prepare for the eventuality um, that we come up with, uh, come up against problems. I mean, you know, the AIDS virus, uh, there is no known cure vaccine uh, for this. And it is like COVID-19, a virus. I'm not saying they're similar because AIDS is notoriously uh, lethal and people are very, very sure um, that uh, a, a vaccine against COVID-19 can be produced. But just going by history, um, you know, we should prepare that we prepare ourselves for the fact that we might have some kind of par paradigmatic blindness and that we should prepare for other eventualities. But I'll leave it there today. Let me know what you think. Uh, do you think Kuhn can help us in any other ways uh, today? Um, uh, how else do you think Kuhn's philosophy could be applied? Let me know in the comments. Remember to like, share, uh, uh, subscribe, and always hit that bell. That's the best way to get notifications of new videos and really helps me out. Um, have a great week. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. And by the way, that's a video on the Spanish flu, lessons from the Spanish flu, uh, Spanish flu a normal video, which should be out in the next week or so. Thanks. See you then.